is Lynch's fine. It's just a bloody Norman Collier every week, isn't it? Keep going, okay. I've been told it's not the microphone, it's the lead on, it's Hatman's fault. Anyway, so thank you to Chris for being um, so patient and coming back, even though his funding's run out for this talk, so I'm very, very <laughs> grateful. Apparently there are no Ukrainian or Russian statues in this talk, which is a real shame. We could have chucked the Russian statue to the canal. Um, well, the canal doesn't exist anymore, but there's none anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, right, so welcome to Dr. Chris Strand from Sheffield University. Thank you very much. Okay, right, so around the world in 10 soccer statues, a 45 minute little breeze around to see different monumental architecture, or not so monumental architecture, of football clubs and players and such like. Right, I'll get my thing to work. Is it going to work? Maybe I've got to. Yeah, there we go. It did it. There we go. It works. Right, okay. So. I just talk a little bit about the project I've been doing for the last 10 years. I should say it's not entirely my work. Um, it's with uh, Dr. Fion. Oh, it's with Dr. Fion Thomas, um, who was at the National Football Institute at University of Central Lancashire. Um, she now writes for When Saturday Comes. Um, so it's a joint effort. And it was actually a third person who started it. He came in my office about 10 years ago and he said, I've taken a few photos of football statues. Um, and I wonder how many there are. And as a statistician, it's my job, um, my take on that was, well, yeah, that's my job. I want to find out how many there are. So I went out and started looking to see how many were there in the UK. And I soon realized that actually, um, I, I soon realized that actually in the UK that um, the interesting things were not so much how many, but more the stories around them. There's so many fascinating stories behind them. Um, ultimately, this quote here tells you a lot about it, really. Um, it's from a guy called Kirk Savage, who researched war monuments in the US, but it applies equally to football statues or sports statues of any sort. Uh, the monuments erected by a people reveal who the people really are, and that's, as you'll see, very, very true. So the project's been going on for, said, a decade now, um, two sides to it. One is actually just keeping a record of all the sports statues around the world. Um, we've concentrated on um, football, baseball, cricket, and all the UK sports statues. Uh, you can go on our website and you can see pictures of all of those. You can see the plaque inscriptions, who sculpted it, when it was unveiled, etc., etc. Uh, but the second part of it's more of an academic side of it. Uh, writing book chapters, academic articles, etc., around why the statues exist and what they say about the people who put them up. So, today's talk's about the world's football statues. And if you go to the website, there's actually an interactive map like that. You can see all the statues of the world and click on them. It's worth saying we're about six months out of date. We've got another 50 to add in the next few weeks we've got them lined up so that will hopefully be going going online very soon shall i quit this can you hear me okay without it yeah, yeah it's rubbish isn't it um, radio mics are rubbish i'd much rather project my voice i'm used to doing it my job so okay so world football statues um about 700 of them 200 of them are of anonymous players as well. So there's, there's 200 figures of footballers out there uh, who aren't anyone in particular. 600 plus distinct subjects depicted and 90% of them have been erected in the last 25 to 30 years. So it's a modern phenomenon. Though you will see a few older ones as well a bit later on. Uh, a few basics around them. When I've looked at statues I've tended to try and classify them in terms of location, design, um, who funded them. So location first, different locations find them in. Club stadiums, obviously, national stadiums. Training grounds, there's a few. A bit odd, but yeah, you see them. Uh, city of birth, another really obvious place. City of club, say someone like Brian Clough in Nottingham. Wasn't born in Nottingham, but his statue isn't at Forest. It's in the middle of Nottingham. Um, museums and halls of fame, relatively modern idea at football clubs. 
There's a few statues knocking around there. Uh, galleries, yeah, some of them are art, art, art. Um, graveyards, we'll see a few of those later. And then you get commercial ones. Uh, some people put a statue up to try and advertise a brand, incredibly. Um, and then finally, significant sites, sometimes just directed somewhere that means something. So sites of old football grounds. If you go to the, base, the old side of the old baseball ground in Derby, there's a statue there of some players to mark that. Designs, three basic designs. I've classified them as action, triumph and posed. Action, obviously doing something that involves playing football. Uh, if it's a manager, he might be doing a pointing. If you look at the Don Revy at Leeds, he's sort of going like this. Um, sometimes interacting with fans. That's sort of a, almost a sub-genre of design. Um, triumph, celebrating a goal or lifting a trophy. Very popular ones where if a club's won a big trophy, they like to have a statue of someone lifting it. Jock Steen at Celtic Park, classic example of that. Um, and posed, that's Sven, Sven Goran Eriksson. That's his statue. It's in a swimming pool in his hometown. He can eye up all the young ladies. Um, you can see that statue's a bit, photo's a bit misty because of the steam coming off the swimming pool. Um, incredibly, that is Sven, yeah. Um, so, pose designs, often managers get pose designs because you can't do so much with a manager um, in terms of action. Um, they're seen as more static. Subjects, players, obviously make up the majority of statues. There's plenty of managers, uh, but then there's also things like chairman, fans and referees. That's the statue of the Russian linesman. Of course, he's not Russian, he's Azerbaijani, uh, who won us the 1966 World Cup. Um, and that's in Baku, by the National Stadium there. Uh, there are statues of chairman, there's a Jimmy Hill at Coventry. And he's singing into a microphone like he used to do pre-match at games there. Um, and there are statues of fans. There's some statues of fans up at Sunderland, a little sort of group, um, completely unrepresentative. It's supposed to be fans from the 1950s, but there's as many female as there were male fans. And if you look at a crowd in the 1950s, it's probably like one in ten females. So there's a little bit of sort of political um, edge to these things, or what they're trying to represent. Um, so yeah, statues of all kinds of things football related. As well as individuals, you can have team statues. That one suffered a bit of damage, but that's a statue in Peru um, of a team who actually died in a plane crash. So sometimes it can be in that sort of commemorative way, but more often it's celebrating successful teams. That's the Turkish 2002 World Cup team made into a sort of frieze. And this one's incredible. I said I didn't have any Russian statues, but this is fairly near. That's in Armenia. That's uh, Ararat Yerevan. They won the old Soviet championship in the early 70s. That's a statue of the entire team. And the big stadiums in the background there, you can see as well. So, gone a bit over the top. Um, how do projects happen? Well, majority of the time, but a very slim majority, they tend to be club funded and the statue ends up at a stadium. But there are other people who can get statues put up. Local authorities, fans, particularly at smaller clubs where the club haven't got the money to put a statue up. Local media can be a key point part of a campaign. Football authorities, very occasionally they think we need to put a statue up of someone who's been a great national figure. The sculptor. There are some statues that are just inspired by a sculptor. They do happen. Um, more often or not, though, actually, whoever's first had the first idea, all of that comes together in a committee that gets the statue sorted. And the subject's family get brought onto that as well because no one wants to put up a statue and then the, the wife or partner say, it looks nothing like him. That never looks good. That never looks good at all. So... Okay, so the rest of this talk, I'm going to go around the world and I'm going to pick out ten football statues that, in my opinion, tell us about why football statues are there, the different reasons, different designs, different um, stories behind them. And I'm going to start in the UK, uh, one that you probably, are, a lot of you will be aware of, Stanley Matthews at the Britannia Stadium in Stoke. And this is a classic football statue. 
a classic football statue. It's at a stadium. It's of a, it was when the statue was put up, it was of a player who played 30 odd years before, 30, 30, 30, 30 35 years, maybe 40 years. Um, and it's all about generating nostalgia. It's all about celebrating the authenticity and the tradition of the club. It's celebrating a great, loyal player who was successful. But the reason clubs put these things up, um, as I alluded to at the start there, is that if you can generate nostalgia in fans, then that has been shown to make them bond more with the club. You go along and you see an old hero from your childhood, you think, oh, I love, I love the club then, and they're my club, they're my club, I want to stick with them, just for Sustan. Um, so, this is the sort of thing that football clubs put up. This is a particularly good one, I think. I mean, it's, it's, it's very good. Three different sculptors actually did the three different parts of that. Um, Stanley Matthews, I said, of a time when footballers were more located in a community. Um, footballers would live in the community the time before the... Um, huge wage inflation, huge transfer fees, and they were seen as part of a town. And there's a harking back there, just not just to the player, but to that era, a more grounded era, a time before a million pound transfers. A harking back for childhood, again, the idea of generating nostalgia. Here's a childhood hero, you can see him there. It's also worth noting this statue is at the Britannia Stadium, modern stadium. So another classic thing you see with football statues is they're more likely to be at modern stadiums. And that's partly because modern stadiums have a lot of space around them. It gives the possibility of doing it. But I think more it's to do with a motivation to transform that blank canvas of the modern stadium into something that is of the club. Uh, a modern stadium can just look like a warehouse from the outside, or a, or a B and Q, or something like that. And in order to give it some sense of who the club are and their tradition, to transfer tradition from the old stadium to the new stadium, what better way than putting a, a hero of the club up outside? So the idea of making the football club seem authentic again, not this modern recreation but harking back to their roots. And that's very important to fans as well. Um, don't get the idea that football clubs put these things up just for fun, um, just to be good. There are, there are fairly cynical motivations behind a lot of these things. Now, it, the same motivations transfer from stadium statues to civic statues. If a town has just remodeled their town centre and that town centre's got... Um, Costa Coffee, a Next, a Sainsbury's, a Tesco's, all the same shops. How do you tell that town from another town? You can't. The towns, the towns have lost their identity. In the last 30, 40 years, traditional industries have gone from many medium-sized provincial cities and towns in the UK. And without that sense of identity, you can just become a nowheresville. Now, town councils want to put that identity back into their town. It helps generate income through tourism, visitors, and a sense of pride in the place. How can we put that identity back? Well, a statue of a local hero. Statue of a local hero, who are we going to have? Well, we can't really have politicians anymore. Um, industrialists, there are not so many of them now, because all the industry's gone. The leader of the local call centre is probably not going to get his statue up. Um, <laughs> Politicians, not going to happen, I don't think, like I said. Royals, <laughs> certain royals, definitely not. Um, and <laughs> church figures, not going to happen these days. Military, a bit dodgy. Who's a populist figure that everybody behind the town could get behind? Well, it, these days it tends to be footballers or comedians. There's a lot of comedian statues in the north of England, but particularly footballers. Putting a footballer up in a small town where the industry's gone, or it didn't have a, a 
clear identity anyway. It's serving the same purpose as it is if you put it outside a new stadium. And so it's not surprising. There's a Stanley Matthews in the middle of Burslem as well. They remodelled the town centre. There's something called percentage for art in the UK where developers in certain areas have to give a percentage to be spent on art. So when town centres get remodelled by a developer, they put a precinct in, build a new mall. There's going to be a bit of money floating around for some art. Council, what are they going to do with that money? They want to be popular. They These days, abstract is not so popular. Figurative is popular because they know people like figurative. They've done surveys on this. People want to see their heroes. They want to see real people up there. And a footballer gets put up. So there's Stanley Matthews. Um, his statue has also got one up in Burslem. Not as dramatic as the one at the stadium, but a similar idea. And you'll actually find this. If you look at other football statues in the UK, there aren't footballers in the middle of London in Trafalgar Square. Or indeed in the middle of Birmingham. <laughs> or the middle of Manchester. They tend to be in small towns. Emily Hughes in Barrow, another classic example. Um, you will tend to find football statues and sports statues in small and medium-sized towns where they are the obvious hero. There aren't, there's not so much competition for being the hero. OK, we're going to move on. And we're going to go to... You'll let me go there. London, Thierry Henry. A bit different. Not a hero from 30 years before. There's not the nostalgia effect with Thierry Henry, really. He actually played in the stadium while his statue was outside it. Not many people have done that. That's quite a good effort. Um, one person who might have done that, I don't know. Um, Shane Warren, the cricketer who died yesterday, his statue was put up right at the end of his career. He might well have actually played uh, the MCG. Um, but it's very unusual. So, Thierry Henry, what's this about? Well, there's the idea of the blank canvas again. They moved to the Emirates, and there was actually a process of arsenalisation that took place. They got a branding company in, 2020 Branding Limited, from some hipster place in Hoxton, and they came in and they designed a whole raft of measures to try and make the stadium look more arsenally, <laughs> including statues. Statues, obviously, is the obvious thing to do. And the beauty of statues is they work on different levels. Now, Thierry Henry, not the nostalgia, but he offers a lot of different things. Emirates Stadium, middle of London, they get sports tourists. People come to London who are football fans. A lot of them will walk up to the Emirates from King's Cross just to have a look at it. See Thierry Henry outside. Oh, played for Arsenal. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, Arsenal will be a good team to be as my, my English club, as they were. I'll go and buy something from the club shop now. They're in, aren't they? Um, so there's that appeal to international fans. There's the appeal to your casual Arsenal fan. He was a great player. We had Thierry Henry, brilliant player. But if you look at the design of this statue, it also offers something for the real hardcore Arsenal fan as well. The design of it relates to a particular goal he scored against Spurs, where I think he, he ran all the way down the pitch, scored one end, and then ran all the way back to the Arsenal fans and slid down on his knees. I think that was something like that. Um, now, if you look at the plinth on these statues at Arsenal, they don't say a lot, and I think that's quite deliberate. It just says Thierry Henry, Arsenal career, 99 to 2000 and something. I think they had to change that because he came back after the statue had been put up. Um, anyway... There's not a big plinth saying Thierry Henry, this many goals, he came from France, World Cup winner, blah, blah, blah. None of that. They are taking that information away so a loyal Arsenal fan can look at that and feel he knows something more about Thierry Henry than the casual tourist. It gives him a sense of his authenticity as a fan. And that's the beauty of statues. They can carry different messages. Your sports tourist will go, Thierry Henry, famous World Cup winner. But your Arsenal fan will see that and they'll say, I was at Spurs that day when he scored that goal and ran and did that pose. Of course, someone like Thierry Henry, there's the pose when he did it, it could be maybe not so popular if you're a Spurs fan. And statues can get hijacked. So um, this is obviously the risk. This is the risk. I don't know whether that steward there is a Spurs fan. You need to put that on anymore. 
But you can see how statues can convey multiple messages, and that's what makes them a very powerful tool for football clubs. And that's why they put them up. Okay. Right, we're going to Denmark. You might be slightly surprised to know. But this is the world's first football statue. Okay, this was unveiled um, about 1905, I think. Um, and it's not of a particular player. In fact, it's a sort of Greek figure going like this. And they put a ball at his feet. Now... The reason this was made was because at the time, in Denmark, there was a fashion, a sort of culture called vitalism. It was a cross between art and fitness. The idea, the body beautiful. Young people would go down to the beach and flex and pose. And artists would draw them or do sculptures of them. And so, around the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s in Denmark, you get a lot of nude figures playing sport, the statues. And a sport that was just taking off in Denmark at the time was football. So a sculptor did one like that. That's the first football statue. Now, this fashion actually continued for the next 10, 20 years, and it combined with the early Olympics. All the early Olympics tended to, almost all of them were in Europe. There was Antwerp. Amsterdam, Stockholm, and all these Olympics had cultural Olympiads alongside them, like an art Olympics. And so sculptors tended to put statues in to these Olympics of sports, and football was one they did. So that led to there being a few more football statues, not of specific players, but of figures just playing football. And actually, that fashion has continued in Denmark to today. This is a modern statue in Denmark of the same idea. Two nude figures tackling. Um, so it's interesting how within a particular country, that idea of how we're going to portray football has stayed intact. Now, non-specific subject statues are different in a number of ways. They tend to be artist-led. The artist is doing it to show he can sculpt a human body well. And it's worth saying, if you think football statues are cheap, easy art, and a lot of art critics do, they are not easy to do. I've talked to a number of football sculpt sculptors who do sporting figures, and they always say, it's totally unfair. If I do the Queen, it's easy. She's wearing a long dress. All I've got to do is get her head right, get a footballer. I've got to get the whole body right, including the legs, the knees, everything, because the fans will know. So, sculptors like to do fit figures to show their skill in sculpting the human body. It's an, seen as an artistic skill. So, they tend to be sculptor-led. They're also more imaginative. If a sculptor is doing a statue of an anonymous figure, then he's not bound by having to make it look like a fan's favourite. So, he can do all kinds of interesting things. Um, they can reflect political movements of the time. This is actually what would be called fascist art, a statue in Berlin from 1936 of us almost military strongman footballers striding forward. Um, here's one that is in Portugal. Again, an artist-led figure, almost like the Hulk, and he's running across a bit of gravel towards it. It's a very strange one, that. but um, It just shows you how there's a lot more imagination, generally, in non-specific non-subject specific statues when they're artist led there's that freedom um, occasionally an artist might an artist led statue might be a specific people but again because he's done that for his own artistic interest he can get away with stuff that he couldn't do with a club one and this is a classic example I don't know if anybody has seen this before it's called the headbutt and it's Zidane headbutting Matarazzi in the World Cup final um, and the artist just did that out of choice. And uh, you wouldn't be commissioned to do that. The French Football Association are not going to say, come on, mate, do me a statue of Zidane headbutting that Italian. It's not going to happen, is it? Um, but the artist wanted to do it to show football as combat. So. OK. Right, we're moving on now. To Germany. So this is probably my favourite football statue. If I had to pick one. Um, and it's a political statue. There are statues that are generated for political reasons. And I will touch on another one a bit later in China. Um, but this is a subversive political one. 
It's not propaganda in the sense it's reverse. Uh, this is the, called the rest of Leipzig. So in the 1960s, the old East German government, who controlled the whole state, pretty much everything to do with the state, um, they decided they wanted certain teams to win, basically. So they were going to have an elite team here, an elite team here, an elite team here. Basically, that involved most of the best players going to Dynamo Berlin. Um, but in Leipzig, they said, well, the team that's going to be the best team in Leipzig is Lo Lokomotiv. So we're going to give all the best players to Lokomotiv. Poor old Chemie Leipzig, the chemical works team, had their best players taken. And so at short notice, they had to get a team together at the start of the 63-64 season. And that team went and won the league. A brilliant story. Um, now... In the mid-70s, this subversive East German sculptor called Gunter Schumann, who does all kinds of weird political images, um, he decides to do one of this team. Now, it's obviously a dig at the East German authorities <laughs> to do a statue of this team who were their rejected ones. He went and beat the chosen, the chosen state team. So he did the, this Kemi Leipzig team. Um, and the, the statue is brilliant because it's actually next to the pitch. Amazing old football ground. If you go to Germany, if you like football grounds, this is the one to go to. Huge terrace at one end, old stand along one side, a house on the other side. It's fantastic. Um, and there's, a little, there's a little plaque by it saying who the players were of this team. Um, but it's an example of a statue making a political statement, as in, you might try and crush the people, but actually the people are stronger. Um, you can't organise football. Football has this sense of anarchy. There's the statue looking over the pitch. Um, someone set a flare off in front of it, probably. Um, the one I talked about earlier, this Armenian one as well, the Armenian team that won the Russian Championship in the, the 70s, I think that's another case. The Armenian government put that up after they had independence to say Armenia beat the Soviet Union once. Um, so... I think there's a, there's a lot that goes into these sort of statues from a political aspect. And you'll see some more in a minute in China. Um, but before then, um, we're going to go down to Croatia. And, sorry, go, go down to Serbia. And Belgrade. And you actually see a bit of football here. So... Famous goal. Well, if it is you're a partisan fan. So that was QPR versus Partizan Belgrade. Um, the, the significance of that fixture was that actually that game, QPR beat them 6 2 and then lost the second leg 4 0 and went out uh, in the UEFA Cup in the early 80s. Um, the guy who scored that, Dragon Manse, uh, young partisan striker. Already played a few times for the national team, which was then Yugoslavia. Fantastic footballer. And um, the year after he scored that goal, he was killed in a car crash. Um, allegedly, I don't, there's not proof of this, but allegedly turning his car out the way to stop running over a child. So there's an added sort of tragic dimension to it as well. Uh, absolute hero, partisan Belgrade fans. And... In Eastern Europe, there's a lot of football statues. There's a lot of football statues in Russia, in Ukraine, in Croatia, Serbia. But they're almost always when a player's died. Two reasons for that. There's a, pro, there's a push and a pull. In Eastern Europe, if you get a statue put up when you're alive, it's seen as a curse. It means you're going to die soon. Because statues are for dead people. Conversely, once you've died... <laughs> Once you've died, then there's a tradition that on your gravestone, there's an image put somewhere. Now, if you've got loads of mates or loads of fans, they might put a statue up instead of the picture. And that's what happened with Dragon Manse. Um, Belgrade, obviously a really divided football city, partisan and Red Star. So his, his statue is also a chance for partisan fans to claim a bit of the graveyard. This is... Dragon Manse's place. The statue design, that was his celebration. He used to do the sliding on the knees like this. That's what he was renowned for. And so the statue on the grave, same design, sliding on the knees like that. Um, and 
put up, he's on a partisan shirt on his grave, on the tombstone. And that design of the statue has now gone forward and it's used for various trophies given out at Partizan. It's used for some graffiti there. Um, in a sense, the statue has taken that image, it's created a new image of Mansay that people who never saw him play will now know him as the guy who went like this. So statues can create a collective memory. They don't just reflect it, they create a new one, they transfer it on through the generations. Okay, we're going a long way now. We're going all the way to China. So this is this is another absolute plastic. <laughs> that is a giant victory V of a statue. <laughs> that was erected when China qualified for the 2002 World Cup. And it's erected at the stadium where they got the crucial victory to qualify. It was erected within, between the time that they qualified and played in the finals. They went to the finals and they lost every game and didn't score a goal. Now, that don't look so good for the, the lads in the team, does it? You've had this statue put up of you on this giant victory V with your heads and the, the managers going like this in the middle of it. Also, at their training ground, they put up statues of all the players. Again, this was done between qualifying and the actual tournament. Not just all the players, but all the coaches, all the physios, all the backroom staff, 44 statues, the whole World Cup squad. Statue for each of them, okay? So the problem, of course, happens is that a statue might be permanent, but the context of it changes. They go to the finals, they lose everything. And in China, the concept of saving face is so important, the idea of Xi face. Um, and if you lose face, it's terrible. So after their failure in the finals, no one to know about these statues at all. So these ones at the training ground were just left to the grass to grow and cover them up. But they moved to a different training ground. The V outside the stadium, well, they decided to demolish the stadium, um, build a new one. And they were going to demolish the V. But the guy who'd organised that statue, he went and lived inside the ball to stop them demolishing it. <laughs> And eventually, they agreed for it to not be demolished, but broken up and stored in a warehouse, where it lay for 10 years. Now then, Shenyang, where that, where that stadium was, Shenyang was chosen to be the home of the national games. And suddenly, Shenyang has to celebrate its sporting past. And about all it had was it was the place where China had qualified for the World Cup. And by this point, 10 years on, China has not qualified for any other World Cups. Actually, even qualifying was starting to look quite good again. So they rehabilitate the statue, they put it back together again, and they whack it up with all the players around it, they rehabilitate all of those, and put them in a park. However, I don't know how much you know about Chinese football, but just around the time they're doing this, there's a huge match-fitching scandal. And some of the figures who were in the squad in 2002 were involved in that. So their statues were bent again. They've gone, and it's just there's about 20 of them there. Um, so it's back and forth, back and forth. If you're going to use statues as propaganda, it really is best to be clear that this guy is going to stay as an icon for good. Not, um, it's a much safer policy to do what they've done in Hungary. I don't know, again, how much you know about Hungary's politics, but right-wing leader Viktor Orban constantly looking for images of Hungary's past to try to um, make Hungary seem like this great state. Uh, and... An obvious image of Hungary's great past was the 56 football team. So Orban has been helped funding these statues of the 56 team all over the country, uh, which is a much safer bet. I mean, I don't particularly like Viktor Orban. He's a nasty right wing dictator, as far as I can see. But he's a little bit brighter about doing it than the Chinese were. I think. Um, OK, on we go. We're going down to Australia. Um, and the example of a pioneer statue. So these are quite unusual. Generally, statues commemorate heroes from 20, 30 years before. Statues are usually about memory, not history. If you take one thing away, looking at football statues, they tend to be about memory, not history. It's not the case that the right people get the, the ones who get the statues. It's the people people can remember. Um, now... 
This one's a bit different. This is Johnny Warren, um, Australian footballer. And really, single-handedly, he dragged Australia to have a credible football presence in the 1970s. Australia, a country where the key sports are cricket, Aussie rules, rugby league. Soccer was, was for girls, basically. And this guy got them to a World Cup and was their best player for about 10, 15 years. And they eventually honoured him um, at a stadium in Sydney. Uh, and in my opinion, there aren't enough statues like this. They tend to be in the countries that are actually less successful. Um, in the UK, we don't have many statues of our football pioneers. Clubs certainly don't put them up. It's very, very unusual. If you get a statue of a pioneer in the UK, it tends to be put up by the fans. So this is Phil McGregor, who was founded the Football League. And Villa fans did that, not the club. It's outside Villa Park. So if you're looking for inspiration to do a statue, then it would be nice to see more statues that were the result of fan um, initiatives that actually represent people who created or somehow saved or established your club in some way, rather than just a player who you remember from 30 years ago. Uh, on a similar point, there's very few statues commemorating female footballers. In fact, a few years ago, I'd have been saying there's none. There are a few now. And I think the issue with that is, again, that any female footballers who we might celebrate at the moment are probably pioneers. And they don't tend to do statues of pioneers. We're looking for hero, populist heroes of 20, 30 years ago. And there aren't any female footballers who fit in that category, unfortunately. Um, if you get a statue of a female footballer, again, it's going to not be put up by a club. Um, that's, that's actually the current England women's manager, Sandra Wiegmann. Um, that's her statue in, in the Netherlands, and it's put up by the National Football Association. Um, but, and it makes sense. I mean, women's football clubs in the UK still haven't got a massive fan base. They haven't got a fan base that would get together and do a statue. Uh, and for the club, a female footballer is not going to tick those nostalgia, authenticity, etc. boxes. However, it might tick a few boxes regarding sort of tolerance and reparations, and I'll come to that at the end. Okay. My favourite football in continent, South America. And this is a, a great statue. This is Angel Le Bruna. Um, played for River Plate. And this is an example of statues in terms of rivalry, club rivalry. So the two big clubs in Buenos Aires, River Plate and Boca. And... Boca put loads of statues up in their museum. They've got about 10 or 15 in their museum. Now, River, rather than going for more, have gone for bigger. So they've got this absolute giant <laughs> Le Bruna. Um, they think they haven't got enough space in their, regime, their museum to do more statues than Boca in the museum. So we're going to put an even bigger one outside. And they, they advertise it's the biggest football statue in the world. Um, now... Very important, the fan culture there is much stronger than the UK. Uh, in some senses, in some good senses and bad senses, I mean, going around shooting people, probably not so good. Massive community organisation in order to do stuff, fantastic. And this statue, the bronze of it, was, a lot of it was gained by collecting coins and collecting keys. There were these little pots put round, all around Buenos Aires. As a river fan, you had to put your bronze in there. And then they could either use that directly or sell it to get some better bronze to make the statue. Um, fan statues, a lot of the time, it's in the UK, they're the result of the sort of fan movement of the 1980s, fanzines, independent sports associations. Now, those things were often set up because of a crisis at the club. We need to save the club from the bad owner. But, of course, when you get a better owner in, you've still got that organisation there, and they want something to do. And something they can do is put a statue. And you've seen that uh, before Blackpool were having all the problem with the Oystons, their fans got a statue organised of Jimmy Armfield. Um, and that in Charlton, that was Sam Bartram at Charlton, a fan-run statue. The, the, the fans saved the club in Charlton in the late 80s. But once they were at the Valley again and it was all sorted, you've got this whole organisation there. What are we going to do? Well, we've got all this infrastructure. Let's do a statue. Um, 
And I think fan statues give fans the opportunity to claim ownership both of their heroes and the club as a whole. If the fans get together and put a statue outside the stadium, that's part of them. That's something they've done. It's not the club. And that gives them a claim over the stadium space. Sometimes fans even make a statue themselves. Rene, Rene Higuita, crazy Colombian goalie, scorpion kick. That's in his locality in Colombia. Somebody just got together and made this really bad statue. Have a look on my website. But at least they made an effort. And they keep adding to it around the back with like painting and new plinths behind it and a wall and everything. It's good. Uh, it's very good. Okay. Last couple. Pele. Uh, if I'd done this talk two years ago, I'd have said, Pele, more statues, loads more than anyone else. Not the case anymore. Maradona dying has been a bit of a blow to Pele's statue <laughs> superiority. Um, Pele is now on about 16 or 17, depending on what you call a statue. Maradona's on about 15 or 16. Maradona's caught him up. Maradona's had about eight or nine in the last year, basically. Um, Pele, however, he's actually got three. A uh, classic example of a small town. Who's their hero? Pele. That's the only thing that would make Trey Corosois famous in Brazil. So they're going to exploit it to all, everything they can. Um, Trey Corosois means three hearts. That's the name of the town. Statue on the edge of the town, Pele jumping over three hearts. There's also in the town a statue of Pele's dad. And there's a statue of Pele's mum. So there's Pele with his dad. Young Pele. <laughs> They're going to cash in on Pele. This is what it's all about. Um, he gives them some civic identity. He's their hometown hero. Um, very much like some of the statues in the UK that in the towns, the Stanley Matthews in Burslem, Jackie Milburn in the middle of Newcastle, where it was originally anyway. Um, Jackie Milburn in Ashington, actually, more to the point. Um, hometown hero. But statues are permanent, but people's opinions of them or the figure can change. So here's Pele, and so we put a mask over him. This was before the 2014 World Cup, when there was a lot of trouble in Brazil about money being wasted. And people were not happy, and they weren't happy with, with Pele, because Pele was, Pele's a very diplomatic man. He does not get involved in any trouble. He plays the, top, the party line all the time. And so he was going along with the World Cup's a good thing, whereas the people were angry about it. So they put a mask on him. Um, because there was a campaign at the time where people were masked up to, camp to protest against the, the World Cup taking place there. Uh, there's another problem with statues as well. In countries where um, there's more poverty, metal is worth money. And that's another Pele in Brazil, had his arms cut off by metal thieves. Now being restored. Um, but people think of statues as being permanent. But neither the, the public image of that person, that's not permanent, and the statue itself is not permanent. These things don't last forever. They can get smashed, damaged, removed. Okay, last, last one. So this is in the UK, and um, this is the celebration statue in West Bromwich. So the three black players who starred for West Brom in the 70s, Bats and Regis Cunningham, um, this was put up by a guy called Jim Cadman, who's like an, ind he's like an independent statue organiser. He, he organises statues and takes a cut. Uh, he sorted out, I think, the Revy statue at Leeds, and he's done a couple of others. Um, and he did this one, it took him lots of time to raise the money, because it's three figures, it's very expensive. It's about 150000 for this. Generally think per figure it's about 50000 depending on the price of bronze. But. Um, so, what's this about? Well, the way the statue was presented is it's about education. These great black players, they suffered um, in the 70s, terrible abuse. We want to show that these guys are real heroes. They were barrier breakers. They need to be celebrated to the younger generation. You see all the black players on the pitch now, but this is what used to go on then. These guys broke through that barrier and established black players in the English game. Um, so, there's that element of it, but I think there's also an element of reparations in here. 
Uh, in the US baseball, it's actually much more overt. They actually have dedicated Negro League statue scenes at several baseball grounds to reflect that before the 1940, late 40s, black players were effectively banned from baseball. They had their own Negro League. Um, and so many great players weren't recognised because they couldn't play in Major League. Uh, now, obviously not quite as bad in the UK, but there were, uh, there was a lot of racism against black footballers, 70s, 80s particularly. And is celebrating these guys now a way of trying to say sorry? I think there's a little bit of that in it. Um, but I think there's also a bit of branding going on here as well. So West Brom put this statue up here of Regis Cunningham and Batson. They're effectively saying, we had these three black players in the 70s, we loved them, you bunch of racists in other clubs didn't. Uh, and they've got a point, I mean, in some senses. Uh, but I think there's this sort of tolerance branding that goes on. Some people might call I think virtue signalling feels a bit strong. But um, there is certainly a sense that they're celebrating the fact that they were more tolerant at the time than other clubs were. Um, and actually, this corporations try and do this as well. Corporations try and link into the modern zeitgeist in terms of... Um, in this case, women's foot. I don't know if anybody saw these. They were on the news the other day. Adidas had done some plastic... Uh, those machines where you can print 3D printing in plastic. They've done some 3D printed plastic statues of famous women, including a few footballers, um, which uh, it's hard to be thinking that Adidas are doing this purely out of the goodness of their heart. Oh, there's an attempt to brand themselves as this global tolerance, multinational. Um, so there's Vivian Medema, who plays for Arsenal there. She's one of the figures. Um, but again, you've got to be careful if you do this. So the Scottish Football Association, they want to put a statue of Andrew Watson outside Hampton. Um, he was the first black player in the UK. People often talk about Arthur Wharton, but he was the first black professional. Andrew Watson played as an amateur for Scotland. Um, in the late 1800s. Now, the problem is they've since found out that actually Andrew Watson, um, his father was involved in slave trading. So this now gets a bit tricky. Do we put this guy up? Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, so it's not always straightforward who you celebrate and who you don't celebrate. There are obviously clear lines I think we're seeing in the UK trouble around statues, statues being thrown in the dock in Bristol, um, statues being guarded by people, bizarre, bizarre things like this. But um, when you're actually choosing to put them up, it's not always straightforward either. Um, and again, what happens reflects the people, not Andrew Watson, no one's ever seen him play, there's no video of him, but it reflects our current opinions in society. So that leads back to the point I made right at the start. Ultimately, these statues are about us rather than the people they celebrate. OK. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions people want to ask. It's all right, it's okay. I'm used to shouting at students. So. And some street fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got any questions? Pally interactions, that'd be an interesting one, wouldn't it? Hi, <laughs> right, Chris. Uh, apologies because I've asked you this before, but uh, I'd like your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see if it's changed. If you had the funding to put up a sporting statue anywhere in the world, who would it be and why? Ooh. Ooh. Well, I mean, I, did I say Graham Taylor before? Because. Yeah. Obviously, he got, he's been put up at Watford since. Yeah. So, um, I mean, who did I? I'm trying to think who I said now. Graham Taylor throwing something. Yes, I wanted to put up. So, I wanted to. I'm a Watford fan. And the scene I'd have liked to have had. Um, well, they, they've put a statue of Graham Taylor outside Vicarage Road now. And it's pretty good. But, allegedly, in the early 80s, when Elton John was getting a bit wayward, Graham Taylor went around his house and swiped all the vodka glasses off the table and 
shouted at him. I'd like a statue of that. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Elton and Graham, that would be great. Um, it's very difficult now, actually. Yeah. Um, who would I like to see? I'd like to see more statues of pioneers, more generally. Um, people who were there at the dawn of the game, people who've done good things for the game, rather than just a guy who played 500 games 30 years ago. Um, so, as a general rule, yeah. I can't think of anything beyond that one, that answer though, so I'd probably still stick with that. <laughs> Maybe it'll happen in Watford Town Centre one day when Elton, Elton passes on. Anyone else? So, it's not a question, but um, quite randomly, I was doing this time last week, I was doing uh, a tour of parties on Belgrade's football team. Wow, um, I'm massively jealous. Did you go to the derby? I, w I went to the derby. Oh. But um, our, our guide for the day, a guy called Andrea, Okay. He was a very passionate part of that scam. He told the story, and the story does go in that way that he was actually a sleeping child. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I know, I've heard that as well, yeah, yeah. Um, really, really sad. It was, you, there's some footage, a lot of footage on the internet of him, it's fantastic. There's actually, if you go on the internet and search Dragon Mance, there's a, um, there's a 30 minute Serbian folk song with scenes of his burial in the graveyard and the burial it was like 5,000 partisan fans in the graveyard and every year they do a parade to the graveyard I think to the to the um, to the to the statue on the gravestone so he's still very remembered bronze um, it's hard wearing and you, it's light as well, it's not too heavy. Um, however, that would be the UK and Europe and China. Um, if you go to South America, there's quite a lot that are made with resin and then painted. Um, carbon fiber type designs. Well, there's a few plastic ones as well. And then there's a subgenre, you can say there are a few wooden ones. If you go to Queen of the South, um, up in Dumfries, they've got a wooden statue of three players outside, so it's not just bronze, but bronze is a very convenient material. My least favourite one? <laughs> no, <laughs> Luton ain't got any statues, so they, they, can't, they can't afford a ground, let alone statues. Um, Pleat running, Pleat skipping on the pitch would be quality. I wouldn't mind that, I would, I would, I would respect that. Um, just for trolling Man City, that would be quite good. Uh, Lee's favourite statues. I, I don't like the ones that are corporate. Um, this isn't my least. This is my least favourite plinth. You go to the Bill Shankly statue in Liverpool, um, and Bill Shankly, the man of the socialist man of the people, on the back of the statue, there's a massive advert for Carlsberg, <laughs> and that just doesn't sit right. Um, so that would be my least favourite plinth, I think. And there's a few others out there where the, the funders of the statue get more coverage on the plinth than the actual design. I think it looks silly. In terms of a bad design, I'm not a great fi fan of the Ivor All Church one in Swansea. That's a bit odd. But if you want some really bad design, um, the recent Cristiano Ronaldo in India, the one in India, that's an absolute shocker. Uh, in, in Goa, the west coast of India, have a look on my website, it's a shocker. Uh, I know it's not strictly a player, but I believe they're trying to get some good too. Where do you stand on the uh, Michael Jackson outside for you? Oh, the, if, okay, so the first thing I would say is, the statue I get asked most questions about is Michael Johnson outside for And he's not in the database, because he's not a footballer. Um, it, I'll, I'll tell you the story of that. I mean, that was basically, that was there because Al Fayed ended up selling Harrods. He, he, he did a statue of Jackson because Al Fayed was a bit mad and Jackson was his mate. Um, so he wanted to put this statue up of his mate and he was going to put it at Harrods, but then he sold Harrods. The only other bit of prime London land he had was Fulham Football Club. So he put it up there. So that's why it ended up there. Uh, it's nothing to do with football, bizarrely. Is there a, a go-to sculptor these days? Ah, oh, really good question. Okay, so sculptors, th there are about five or six in the UK who've done multiple statues. Um, a guy called Andy Edwards, he did Taylor and Clough at um, Pride Park. 
he did Alex Ferguson at Aberdeen that was unveiled the other day. He's, he's done about 10 in total, including that one in Liverpool where the 1914 war won, where they're shaking hands over a ball. One. Um, guy called Sean Hedges Quinn, he used to do the animation for Ivor the Engine. He's not really a sculptor, he's a prop maker, but he does amazing football statues. He did Kevin, Be Kevin Beattie and Bobby Robson at Ipswich, and he did Stoko at Stadium of Light. Um, he's very good. It, quite often, it will be a sculptor from the local area who gets picked, so local or local region. Um, there is a, there's a regional element to this, so Douglas Jennings did the both at Fulham, and he did Graham Taylor at Watford. Um, he's sort of the, the, the London one. The top of the range, if you want to get the very best, Philip Jackson, he's the royal sculptor, he did the Queen, the Queen Mother. Um, he's done the statues at Man United and at Chelsea, and he did Bobby Moore at Wembley. Um, but he charges a premium. Hmm? Can he do legs? Yeah, well, that, he was the one I interviewed who talked about that. I mean, he takes it... I mean, he considers some of the other statues as a bit rubbish because all they've done is copy a photo, whereas he looks at lots of photos and he interprets it and comes up with his own design. But you're paying for that. But there was no about the tiny legs. Oh, so that was Ted Bates yes. um, at Southampton. That only lasted a week, and they did a, got Sean Hedges Quinn to do a better one. Um, yeah, and he looked like Milan Mandaric, the Portsmouth chairman. It was, a, it was terrible. But of course, Ted Bates at Southampton might get taken down now anyway because of there were child abuse allegations at the club at the time he happened to be at the club. It does seem a little bit tenuous. Uh, I think he's probably going to survive, but there were, there were talks about it. It wasn't clear. <laughs> I actually haven't kept counting. I haven't ticked that many. I don't, att I don't attempt to do that. I mean, there's just too many. It's unachievable. I like achievable targets, and that's completely unachievable. There's about 1,000 sta football statues in the world overall. I'm not going to ever tick them all off. I've, I've probably seen virtually all the UK ones, but just because I've been to games. Watford have been for a lot of divisions, so... <laughs> Oh, uh, I'd love to see that crazy Chinese one. I'd love to see that. Um, that's amazing. I'd like to see some of the ones in Hungary because some of them are really, really good. And there's one of Ferenc Puskas in his local town, well, his local town, the town he was born in. And it's him as an old man playing football with children, um, just kicking a ball and showing the kids how to control a ball. That's really good. I'd like to see that. Um, yeah, they would be the ones that I would have. Oh, and there's, um, some of the South American ones I haven't seen. There's one that's incredible. I mean, I won't try and get it up now because I'll end up fiddling on my computer for 10 minutes, but um, you can look it up on the website. It's um, in the province of Tucumán, and it's a team called Penarol, but obviously not the Penarol in Uruguay. They've called them, named themselves after that. And if you look, it's basically in the middle of the Andes, you go along this dusty road, and in the middle of the road, there's this massive football statue for the, as you come into the town. This is all the town cares about. It's their little football team they've named after Penarol. So I'd love to see that one as well. So that would be very good. Thank you, thank you very much for the invite, David. I look no, forward no, to doing this for, yes, for two years, so I'm probably going to do it. Uh, 23rd of April, our next talk, which is the Gentleman Ultras of Corona, which is a look at the current football scene in Italy.